1 Peter chapter 5, and in our last study, we considered Peter's exhortation to the elders concerning their responsibilities in verses 1 through 4. This morning, uh, the plan is to finish the chapter and, of course, thereby finish 1 Peter. Now, there's only 14 verses in chapter 5, so we'll pick it up in verse 5, and I think we'll be able to get it done. And this is lesson number 20, but with five chapters, that averages out to about four lessons a chapter. So uh, we didn't fly through it, but we didn't drag through it either. And uh, it took me longer than I thought it would. Uh, uh, First Peter is, uh, I've heard people say it's milk, but boy, there's a lot of meat in First Peter. And we could uh, spend a lot more time in it, but hopefully... Uh, through this study, you gained an understanding of what First Peter is all about, and uh, we went through every passage. We didn't examine every detail, but we, we did look at every passage verse by verse. So if we're going to make it to the end, we've got to jump right in. So let's go, verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon Him for He careth for you. So the elders, as in leaders in the church, are to take the oversight, as we saw in verses 1 through 4, but even so, they are to serve among their brethren. Peter said, feed the flock of God, in verse 2, which is among you. Then he says, taking the oversight. So, there has to be leadership, that's what God ordained, and yet the leaders are to have a servant's mentality. They're not lording over people, they're serving, and they're serving among the brethren. Um, boy, I tell you, there, there's extremes on this. People who, on one hand, they deify their leaders, promote them too highly, then on the other hand, they defy their leaders. They don't respect them. Both are wrong, okay? And uh, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, the same principle, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number uh, 12. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. So you notice that he said they are laboring among you, and yet they are over you in the Lord. In other words, the Lord ordained that leadership. Okay, but leaders are, of course, to first of all submit to God, do things His way. And then to submit to others and serve others, it's not a dictatorship. It's a servant's heart when it comes to leading God's people. So whether you're talking about this age of grace or you're talking about the little flock, the same principle holds true. And so in 1 Peter 5, likewise. So the leaders were among the brethren taking the oversight, but, but serving likewise. He's still on this issue of submitting and serving. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Now, I mentioned last time that the elders don't have to be old physically. They need to be mature spiritually. But oftentimes, that coincides between people who are older and more spiritually mature. But Timothy was an elder, uh, and yet he was a young man. So the issue is spiritual maturity when it comes to elders in the church. But here, ye younger submit yourselves unto the, el unto the elder, I, I think is he's contrasting the younger and, and, and the elder. So there needs to be great respect shown uh, to the elder people in the church. And Paul says the same thing. First, uh, First Timothy 5, 
You know, there's a lot of churches today that totally disrespect the older people that built the church. Now, God builds the church, but you know what I'm saying. People who labored to get the church started, to get it going, who paid for the building, who did all this, and there are people today, they, they're, they're, uh, they have a model where they're trying to just build a crowd and uh, uh, the music they go to and the entertainment they go to, a lot of the older folks have enough sense to know that's wrong, but they disregard that, disrespect that, and even have the attitude, leave if you want to, we're reaching the young people. That's the future. Well, I'll tell you this, you know how you reach people? I don't care if it's young people, old people, or what people. You reach people with the gospel. You reach them with the word of God. But there, there are, and I've seen it, some of the material, uh, these um, contemporary churches, they all go by the same game plan. They have a game plan on what they're doing, and they say you will lose the older crowd, but let them go. They don't care. Now, disrespectful. 1 Timothy 5, 1 Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. And the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. Relationships in the church, the family of God, treat each other as a family. Well, the older men need to be respected like a father and the older women like a mother, and there needs to be that respect. And so Peter's saying, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, but here's the thing, the whole church needs to be in subject one to another. He said, yea, all of you be subject one to another. Um, Paul said in Ephesians 5, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So the, the idea of serving others, um, everybody in the church, even the leadership, Needs to have that mindset. And uh, hold a marker here and look at John 13. John chapter 13. This has always been a very convicting passage to me. When Jesus stoops to wash the disciples' feet. It's interesting how Peter's talking about this because he, I think he got the lesson Jesus was teaching at, at the time. He didn't get it then, but he, 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 he understood by the time he wrote 1 Peter. The whole point in John 13 about washing feet is not washing feet. That's not the point. The point is service and sanctification. There's a lesson here on humbling yourself and serving, but there's also a lesson on keeping your feet clean as in walking in a clean way. Sanct sanctification. So there's, there's a lot in it. We won't take much time with it, but let's just remind ourselves of this passage in John 13, now, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world. He's going to the cross and he knows it. That's, that's in his mind and his heart in this context as he's looking towards that. Uh, depart out of this world of the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God. Now keep that in mind. I mean, the, this mindset, uh, he is God. He's, he, he took on flesh. He came from God. He's going to God. He is God. He's one with the Father. With, being fully aware of who he is and what he came to do, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. I mean, lowliness. And I couldn't, I couldn't imagine. I can't. I'm just being honest with you. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> you say, wash my feet. I say, get out of my face. I ain't touching your feet. I, but I'm just not there yet. I'm just being honest with you. <laughs> but the Lord, the Lord, stooping to wash the dirty feet of his disciples, it just blows my mind. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. 
Now, if the whole point was that we need to have an ordinance of foot washing, that wouldn't make any sense because obviously he was washing their feet. But what Jesus said there proves the point is deeper. It's not just about physically washing someone's feet. There are churches that believe we need to wash, they have foot washing services. Now, I believe everybody ought to wash their feet on a regular basis, you know, uh, but uh, I'm not going to help you with it, you know, like I said. And, and the Bible doesn't command that we have to do that. You know, that command, that's not the point. The point is humility. We do need to be clothed with humility, yes. But anyway, he said, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Well, Peter got it later on. Peter saith unto him, you know, this is a typical of Peter, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Telling the Lord what to do. How about that? Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me, Simon Peter. And it goes to the other extreme. Saith to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. And, you know, and there's a, a teaching here about, and by the way, Paul said uh, that we need to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and the fear of God. We need to cleanse ourselves. Now, we are cleansed the moment we get saved in our standing, but in our state, how we walk, we need to keep our own feet clean by the water of the Word of God. So there is a standing issue and a state issue. He said, For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, You're not all clean. Of course, Judas was there, and he's a devil from the beginning. So after he had washed their feet, he had taken his garments and was set down again. He said to them, Know ye not what I've done to you? Now, so here's the issue of humility. You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well... For so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example. This is a great example of humility and service that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye. Well, that's not all it says, is it? If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. The happiest people out there are the people serving others and not making everything about themselves. And if you're ever feeling down, you're ever feeling depressed, you're ever feeling discouraged, you ought to get up and go do something for somebody. And by the way, you don't have to broadcast it when you do. I'm, I'm, when people do things for the applause, they don't have the right heart in what they're doing. To me, it bothers me if I do something for someone because I want to and I want to help them, and then people know I don't want. That's not the point. You don't do things to get recognized because you don't have the right heart about it. But when you just sincerely do things to help others, there's a great joy in that. So Peter got it, didn't he? He said, "Be clothed with humility. Be subject one to another." And he said. For God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. You know, the moral principles of God never change. God hates pride in every dispensation. Every person struggles with pride. And if you don't think you do, you're too proud to admit it. Everybody does. It's part of the human nature. I know some people might be a little more cocky than others or whatever, but everybody has a pride issue. So we need to take this to heart. I want to walk in line with God. I don't want to walk in such a way God wants to resist what I'm doing. You, you understand? And if I walk in pride, that's hindering what God wants to do in my life. So I need to walk... In fact, I need to be clothed with humility. What a way to say that. I mean, it's got to be a way of life. Um, Proverbs has a lot to say against pride. Proverbs 3.34, and this may be what Peter's alluding to, this verse, Proverbs 3.34. Surely he scorneth the scorners. Talking about the Lord. I mean, what a, what a statement. And, the, and Proverbs had a lot to say about scorners and their attitude. And God's against it. But he giveth grace unto the lowly. 
<clears throat> that has, being lowly has to do with humbling yourself. He giveth grace unto the lowly. Uh, I'm not going to look at all the references. There's a good number of them we can look at just in Proverbs. But look in Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6, verse number 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Now, that, that's a, an expression to denote that this is not an exhaustive list. There's other things God hates that's not in this list. So when he says six, yea, seven, that's a way of saying it's not exhaustive, but it's a good representation. A proud look. That's the first thing on the list. And notice it says a look because some people may not verbalize it, but their attitude is clear. You ever seen people that they may not say a lot about their... You wouldn't know it by their words, but you know it by their nose in the air. Right? Stuck up. Right? Think you're better. You, you ain't better than a, any person out there. Look, it's what we are, we are by the grace of God. That, that attitude that we're better, you know. A proud look. Bob talks about the lofty eyes, you know. Just <laughs> a lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. And heart that deviseth wicked imagination. This is the anatomy of sin. You notice all these parts of the body. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. That proves God hates the mainstream media. And he that soweth discord among the brethren, mainstream media. That's, right now we're seeing like never before an attempt to, to try to divide people to conquer people. It's on purpose. They want to stir everybody up. But um, anyway, notice the words there. Lying tongue, false witness, he that... Speak, uh, so with discord among the brethren. God hates it. And He still does. I believe He still does. I don't think in the age of grace God said, you know what? Who cares anymore? <laughs> I, in fact, I kind of like pride. It's not how it works. Paul warned about pride, didn't he? In a number of places. And, and, and pride is that first sin of Lucifer. He lifted up his heart in pride. And it's a root sin that leads to many other sins. And we need to beware of it. Um, we're nothing without God. We must depend on the Lord. Proverbs 16 verse 5 says, Everyone that is proud in heart... See, that's the issue. Heart. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, you can get together in a crowd all you want to, he shall not be unpunished. You can't hide in a crowd. God knows who you are. Though hand join in hand. It's not going to change the justice of God. But everyone that is proud in heart. Okay? So, God resisteth the proud. He giveth grace to the humble. That is a moral principle that never changes. We see it all through the Scripture. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the mighty hand of God. 1 Peter 5, 6 that He may exalt you in due time. Uh, the little flock must depend upon God if they're going to endure to the end during the 70th week of Daniel. There's no way they're going to do it on their own. They must humble themselves under the mighty hand of God and in due time at the second coming, He'll exalt them to glory. But they're going to have to humble themselves. And it's interesting, He said, casting all your care upon Him for He careth for you. Now that's a great statement. Um, the word care can be used in more than one way. You've got to look at the context. And here in the same verse, there's a different idea. Our care has to do with worry and fear and anxiety and whatever. Just be overly concerned about things. But God's care, God doesn't worry about anything. But he, He's concerned about us. What a statement. He careth for you. He careth for you. You know what? If nobody else seems to care... Who cares if God cares? <laughs> if He careth for you, isn't that what matters most of all? 
And um, Psalm 55, there's an interesting connection here in Psalm 55 about casting your care upon the Lord. There, there's a, a passage here where he talks about casting your burden upon the Lord. And how do you do that, by the way? How do you... And your care would be your burden, what's weighing you down, what you're you know, anxious over. How do you cast it upon the Lord? In humility, you say, Lord, I can't carry this. I need you to strengthen me. Pride makes us think we can, we can handle everything. I'll take care of it, you know. But we ought to pour out our heart before God and rely on Him and say, Lord, I need you. That pleases the Lord. Psalm 55 and verse number... Notice in verse number 20. He hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He hath broken his covenant. Now, this is going to apply to the Antichrist. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter. You better watch that. <laughs> you better watch that. You better watch somebody that's trying to butter you up. Somebody said, when somebody's constantly patting you on the back, all they're doing is wiping off a place to stab you. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were they drawn swords. The Antichrist is going to make a covenant with Israel. He's going to flatter them. He's going to come in peaceably, but then he's going to turn on them and seek to destroy them. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. That's how they're going to make it through, in resisting the beast and enduring to the end. But thou, O God, shalt bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I'll trust in thee. Those that exalt themselves will be destroyed, but those that humble themselves will be exalted. That, that is the, the, the moral principle of God you see all through the Scripture. So Peter said, you need to be clothed with humility. Well, if they're going to be clothed with white, white raiment, like you read about in the book of Revelation, the tribulation saints have white raiment. It's the righteousness of saints. Uh, if they're going to be clothed with white raiment, meaning they are going to resist the beast. In fact, let me read from uh, Revelation chapter 3 where it talks about white raiment in verse number 5. Revelation 3, 5 he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And then again in verse 18, uh, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyes, Sabbath, that thou mayest see. This idea of the white raiment in the book of Revelation, they're not going to be clothed with white raiment if they're not clothed with humility. They're going to have to put their trust in the Lord and humble themselves. Look, the self-righteous. See, that's the thing you've got to watch. When we're talking about it, those in the 70th week of Daniel enduring, they're doing it trusting God. Not Self-righteousness, God always hates that. It's not about a man being righteous in himself. These people can only be righteous in the Lord as they humble themselves. Look in James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Verse 6. But he giveth more grace. James 4, 6. You know, grace... Peter talked about the manifold grace of God. So, there's different applications to it. He resisteth the proud, giveth grace to the humble. Well, if you're, if you're saved, you're, you've already been saved by grace, but you still need His grace each day to serve Him. He giveth more grace. Wherefore, He saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. That sounds like something we better take note of. It's repeated several times in the Bible. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That's the number one thing. If you submit to Him, you don't have any issues submitting yourself to others the way you ought to in serving. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But you've got to first submit to God. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted to mourn and weep. Your, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. 
Okay, and that's what they're going to have to do. And there's moral application in here for us as well, of course. Now, um, those who humble themselves will be exalted. And uh, uh, Proverbs, you, you can turn there if you want. A lot of, a lot of cross-references here this morning. That's the way to study the Bible. Uh, Proverbs 15.33. Proverbs 15.33. And I'll see, I hear the pages, so I'll give me a moment to take some coffee. Proverbs 15:33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. It takes humility to fear the Lord. People who are full of pride don't fear God. That's one of the marks of humility. You fear God. And before honor is humility. I don't seek the honor of men. That means nothing to me. It's cheap. It's cheap and worth nothing. What we ought to concern ourselves is the honor that comes from God. Amen. Judgment seat of Christ is the ultimate place where all that will be sorted out. But that's what we ought to desire. Before honor is humility. And uh, Proverbs 18.12 and before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. 22.4. Proverbs 22.4. By humility and the fear of the Lord. See how that goes together? Our riches and honor and life. Well, you ought to study everything the Bible says about the fear of the Lord. It's a wonderful thing. It's a healthy thing. And there are many uh, great results that come from it. Now, um, Christ, the greatest example of humbling himself. And what happened? Paul said he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He who was in the form of God took on the form of a servant. There's no greater example of serving than the Lord Jesus Christ. But it says, wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. That's from Philippians 2. What a contrast with the Antichrist. What does he do? He magnifies, he exalts himself. Paul said he exalteth himself above all that is called God. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 the Antichrist exalts himself so he will be thrown in the bombless pit for a thousand years. Well, the Antichrist, he and the false prophet will be thrown in the lake of fire at the second coming. Satan in the bottomless pit. Then he's loosed. That final battle after which he's thrown in the lake of fire also. But um, in Isaiah 14... Which the passage has to do with the fall of Lucifer, but it also has to do with the Antichrist, because the Antichrist will be filled with Satan. So it's both historical and prophetic. But what, is, what does Lucifer say five times? I will, I will. I, what did Jesus say? Not my will, but thine be done. But five times the number of death, and if you study it with Ezekiel 28, a cross reference about the fall of Lucifer, God said, I will. And he's talking about his judgment on Satan. And there's a five-fold degradation. You can trace that out. He said he'll exalt himself. He said, I will five times, but he goes down five times, ultimately to the lake of fire. And I think he'll be at the very bottom of it. No parties in hell. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And so, uh, verse 8, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober. Of course, Peter's already talked about this, being sober-minded, being having a ready mind. Uh, several verses already he's uh, exhorted on this. Be vigilant, which, you, you know, you're being watchful. You're not being careless. You're on guard. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. 
So, in the passage here, you have the chief shepherd and you have the roaring lion. Now, of course, Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but Satan's a counterfeiter. So he wants to act like he's a roaring lion, but uh, the chief shepherd is going to whip the roaring lion. You remember when David, who took good care of his flocks, David, as a young man, before he, before he cut Goliath's head off, Sweet little David, you know, cut the giant's head off. Isn't that something? By the way, you really think he was a little boy? Now, he needed the Lord. The Lord did it, not David. But the point is, he didn't use Saul's armor because he hadn't tried it. He hadn't proven it. So he put his trust in God. But if he could wear Saul's armor, David was a big dude. Because Saul was. He was a young man, but he wasn't a little pipsqueak walking around like you see in the, in the flannel graphs. The sweet psalmist, after he killed that giant, took his own sword and cut his head off and held it up and said, Victory! Let's go kill more Philistines. Amen. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. But before, before uh, that, you know what had happened? He was out there keeping his father's flocks and there was a bear, there was a lion. He killed, both. He killed a bear and a lion. That's, now that's a strong dude, all right? Now again, he got his strength from the Lord. He said, blessed be the Lord that teacheth my hands to war. Who made God, who, who made David the warrior he was? The Lord did. The Bible says the Lord is a man of war. Now, I understand we're in the age of grace. And God's dealings with man are different in this age. But I also know, if you doubt that the Lord is a man of war, read the book of Revelation. Okay, these people running their mouth, opposing God. I mean, they, I mean, he's got it all worked out. He'll take care of it all. He's so long-suffering though, isn't he? It's amazing how long-suffering God is. But it will, he will bring the age of grace to an end, and then he will declare war. And he wins. No doubt about it. So anyway... Um, David slew a lion and a bear. And I think about, when I read this passage, I thought about that. Here's the chief shepherd over all, the Lord. And here's a roaring lion. But you know what? Chief shepherd is going to watch over his flock and he's going to defeat that roaring lion. Uh, Satan, you know, Paul warns us so much about Satan. He's our adversary also. But when Paul talks about Satan... He talks about him in terms of deception, and that's the main way he's working today. Paul said you need to watch out for that angel of light. He is the prince and power of the air, and he appears as an angel of light. Isn't that different from a roaring lion walking on the earth, devouring people? Uh, Satan changes in how he deals with man. Just like God does. And whatever God's doing, that's how Satan works in opposing what God is doing. And so the point is, Satan's going to be, he is the prince and power of the air, but he's going to be cast down to the earth in the 70th week. Look in Revelation 12. Revelation 12. He's going to be down on the earth, walking about, seeking to devour the godly remnant of Israel who reject the beast. And you have a wonder in heaven in the beginning of this chapter. It's a sign, and then you have what actually happens described in the latter part of the chapter, what that wonder represents. So let's pick it up, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. That means Satan and his angels presently have a place in heaven. Not where God's throne is, but you know there are three heavens. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And that's, that's, that happens in the midst of the 70th week, right there in the midst of that seven years. And he, he, take, he possesses the Antichrist. The, the man of sin becomes the son of perdition. He has a death, burial, and resurrection. And when he comes up from the dead, he's Satan, incarnate. I'm talking about the Antichrist. 
And I heard a loud voice saying, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God, the power of His Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, who accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives unto death, willing to be martyrs. Uh, and, they, and there are going to be many martyrs. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devils come down unto you having great wrath. There's that roaring lion. Because he knoweth he hath but a short time. Three and a half years. When the dragon saw that he was cast out unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. That's Israel. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she's nourished for a time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years. From the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he is... He is um, as a roaring lion walking about on the earth. Now in Revelation uh, 2, um, let's see, I have these references written down somewhere. Revelation 2, well, let's go ahead and look at it. Revelation 2. The seven churches, as I've told you many times in Revelation, the whole book of Revelation is sent to them because it has to do with them. And these are churches in the 70th week. Not us. We're caught up before the 70th week even comes. But notice in Revelation 2, 8, and, and on the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, rich in faith. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews that are not, but are synagogue of Satan. That distinction between Jew and Gentile comes back after the rapture. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Well, you must be on the earth then, that ye may be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful in the death, I'll give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith in the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard the second death. Well, you know, uh, we who are in the body of Christ don't need a promise like that because there's no way we can be heard of the second death. But you have this issue of uh, the devil casting them into prison. And let's read on a little bit. And the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword two edges, I know thy works where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast, denied, hast not denied my faith, even those days where Anubis my, was my faithful martyr who was sl slain among you, where Satan dwelleth on the earth. You see that? Right now he's not on the earth. I'm not saying he doesn't come to the earth, I don't know. But I mean, primarily his place is in heaven. He's the prince power of the air. Paul warned about spiritual wickedness in high places, didn't he? And so what about in the days of Job? Wasn't Satan walking up and down on the earth? You know what that is? That's claiming territory. Saying this is my territory. And uh, you know Job is a picture of the godly remnant in the tribulation. It's 42 chapters. It's like there's 42 months of great tribulation. Satan's the accuser of the brethren just like he was the accuser of Job. And Job goes through that trial, comes out doubly blessed. Just like Israel is going to go through tribulation and come out doubly blessed. In fact, it's prophesied in Isaiah they'll be blessed double. So it's interesting how all that ties together. And by the way, it's in the book of Job. You have the greatest description of Satan in the Bible. Leviathan. That's who he is, the great red dragon. People say, oh, he's talking about a hippopotamus, you know, or something, you know. Leviathan is a king over all the children of pride. I don't know any hippos like that, do you? Crocodile, whatever. They have all these, you know, um, behemoth. And yet people try to tell us, commentaries would tell you behemoth is an elephant. Well, it says he moveth his tail like a cedar. They don't, you ever seen an elephant's tail? It's not like a cedar. <laughs> All right. So, back in First Peter, uh, they must be sober and vigilant and humble themselves, trusting in God if they're going to be able to go up against the devil. And Peter talked about be so. In First Peter one, uh, he said, um, 
Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And um, verse, chapter 4, verse 7, uh, be, the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. So this is talking about the end of the world. This is talking about the second coming. And so they got to be sober also because of their adversaries on the earth trying to devour them. Satan tries to annihilate Israel, but God's going to save Israel and set up his kingdom and put Satan in the bottomless pit. So they, it says, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Resist steadfast in the faith. That's the key. They got to be in the faith. Remember in James 4, submit to God, resist the devil. Their resisting the devil won't work if they don't first submit to God. And then he said, uh, the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Where they're, that's talking about their Jewish brethren. And that during the tribulation, what are they? They're scattered. Peter is addressing the scattered people. Well, in Matthew 24, you don't have to turn there, but uh, at the second coming, the angels gather the elect from the four winds. They're scattered all over the world. The Antichrist is going to have a worldwide kingdom. He's not only going to come after those Jews in the land, and they're going to have to flee out into the mountains, depart out of Jerusalem, but their brethren scattered through the world are going to be greatly afflicted. And I've heard, I've heard pro uh, prophecy teachers claim that everything in the 70th week is centralized, or not centralized, that's not the right word, it's just, it's, it's localized to the Middle East. But it is a worldwide deal. Christ is going to have a worldwide kingdom. Well, say, uh, the Antichrist first has a counterfeit worldwide kingdom. Revelation 13, 7 talks about it, that he's going to rule over all kindreds and tongues and nations and whatever. It's going to be a worldwide kingdom. It's a, it's a one world religion, one world government, and <clears throat> everything is headed that way now. Even though we're not in the 70th week, everything is headed that way. Verse 10, but the God of all grace, 1 Peter 5, 10, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you suffered a while, make you perfect, establish strength, and settle you. Verse 11, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, that, that is just a summary of what he's been emphasizing all through here. He concludes with a summary. And what's, what's been emphasized? First suffering, then glory. First suffering, then glory. Well, he said after you suffered a while. Good news is suffering's temporary. But he said eternal glory. Glory in the kingdom is eternal. But first they've got to suffer a while. But God is going to use that suffering for their own good. He's going to, through that, make them perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle them. And God will get all the glory, and He'll have the dominion. He's the God of all grace. Paul said that. Uh, or, uh, God, uh, Peter said that here in 1 Peter 5.10, the God of all grace. Well, the manifold grace of God. There's different. His grace shows up in various ways. Uh, but He's the God of all grace, and they're going to need that to endure the 70th week. Uh, 1 Peter 1.6 uh, wherein you, you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, just for a while, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. Well, the, God has manifold grace for their manifold temptations. But He's called them to this eternal glory in the kingdom, but first they must suffer a while. Um, but He said He's going to, in 1 Peter 1, the trial with fire will purify them. It's for their own good. Job said, when He hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. James 5 said, you, you've heard of the patience of Job. He said, look, look at the end of Job. Look at, look, he went through the suffering, but look what God did for him. And so that's an example to them. And of course, Paul too talks about eternal glory. And Paul said, the sufferings of this present time, not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. So it's the same idea. But again, this is talking about the sufferings of the tribulation and the glory of the second coming of Christ. Verse 12, by Silvanus... A faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I've written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Greet you one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So Sil Silvanus and Marcus, I believe, is 
Silas and Mark that, that Paul uh, talks about or that travel with Paul in the book of Acts. So here's the thing. They're with Peter when Peter writes this. They travel with Paul later. So that helps us understand when this was written. I believe this was written before Acts 15 for sure. It was written after Acts 11 because they were called Christians first in Antioch and Peter uses the term Christian. But at the end of Acts 12, Peter, after he gets out of prison, he goes to another place and I believe that place is Babylon. And so he writes this around the time of the end of Acts 12. That's early, very early. So Silas and Mark were with Peter in the kingdom church, but then they later transition into Paul's ministry. So this was written before they began to travel with Paul. Uh, this grace of God, this is the true grace of God. Peter mentions grace eight times in 1 Peter. This is the age of grace, but that doesn't mean this is the only age God shows grace. He shows grace in every age. So uh, Peter talked about a prophesied grace, right? Israel's going to be saved under a new covenant. It's a covenant of grace. That's the true grace of God. And he says true grace of God because there's false teachers that Jude warns about who turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, a false grace. Beware of a false grace. There's a lot of people like that still today. But you have a contrast here, but Peter emphasizes grace because Israel's going to be saved by grace. Now, according to the book of Revelation, Babylon will once again be a world power in the last days. Babylon is mentioned six times in the book of Revelation. It just happens to be six. Of course, the Antichrist number is 666. Babylon, don't miss this now, you know what Babylon is in the Bible? Babylon. Not Rome. Rome is not the mother of harlots. That's a daughter of the harlot. The mother of harlots, all idolatry flows out of ancient Babylon. And, it's, and there's a prophecy in Zechariah. It's coming back in power. And there is no scriptural evidence Peter ever went to Rome. Bible never, you know, you got, supposedly he's the first pope, he goes to Rome. He never went to Rome. There's no, in fact, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. In fact, he didn't travel west to Rome, he traveled east to Babylon. And so Babylon is Babylon. There's a church there in Babylon. He calls them the elect. Well, Matthew 24 talks about the elect of Israel. He's going to gather his elect. So I believe that's what he's referring to. There are elect churches that, in the tribulation like uh, 2 John, the elect lady. Talking about a church. Um, we're elect in this age in the body of Christ. And we, we did a whole lesson just on election when we started this study. But there is an elect of Israel, and I believe that's what Peter's talking about. And he said, greet one another with a kiss of charity. I think there, he said, uh, not just a kiss, make it a kiss of charity, because there is such a thing as a kiss of betrayal. Judas kissed the Lord when he betrayed him. And there are going to be many in Israel that betray their brethren the same way, just like Judas. That's why John brings up Judas and talks about loving your brother. And so on. And Judas was that son of perdition. And it's that same spirit that was in Judas is going to be in the Antichrist. There's going to be a lot of betrayal in the tribulation. So they need to have real charity. And he said, peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Now, the body of Christ in this age is in Christ. Okay, but there were saints before this age started. And there will be saints after this age ends that are also in Christ. On this side of the cross, you're either in Adam or in Christ. Jesus talked in John 17 in His prayer to the Father about those who would be in Him. Israel's going to be in the Lord. But that doesn't mean they're the body of Christ. What makes the body of Christ what it is, it's neither Jew nor Gentile. It's a spiritual body. But when you read they're in Christ, people try to say, see, that's the body of Christ. Well, i got news for you. The saints in the tribulation are in Christ. Israel will be in Christ. I can show you verse after verse on that. They're going to be in the Lord. Because on this side of the cross, like I said, everybody's either in Adam or in Christ. So that little flock is going to stand by grace and be in Christ. All right. Well, we're out of time, so we got to stop there, but we got it done. All right. We can start over next week and go back through and pick up some more things, but I hope that was helpful to you to understand 1 Peter. Thank you, Father, for the Word of God.